You're watching Tag TV. You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin today's show with India where the Modi government unveiled its first budget of the second tenure. The budget was essentially aimed at boosting infrastructure and giving foreign investors a bigger role in India's giant insurance and aviation sectors. The country also aims to be a $3 trillion economy by next year. A report. The first ever budget presented by Nirmala Sitaraman, the new finance minister of India, says that India will be a $3 trillion economy before next fiscal year and a $5 trillion economy in few subsequent years. The budget that aims to bring a life of content for all has focused on each sector and each individual contributing in the building of nation. In a major step to reform the education system of the country, the government will bring in new education policy to propose changes in school higher education. The government has put huge weight behind securing and gaining more foreign direct investment in the coming years. It's high time. India not only gets integrated into global value chain of production of goods and services, but also become part of the global financial system to mobilize global savings, mostly institutionalized in pension, insurance, sovereign wealth funds and so on. I propose to further consolidate, Speaker Sir, the gains in order to make India more attractive FDI destination. India has decided to liberalize FDI in aviation, media, animation and insurance intermediaries. It has planned to set up a credit guarantee enhancement cooperation. It also aims to hike statutory limits for foreign investments in some companies. The government aims huge constructions in the domestic infrastructure where it will repair, rebuild and encourage new initiatives of private players. The government aims to upgrade 125,000 kilometers of roads in the next five years. It plans to spend around $72 billion on railways between 2018 and 2030. The government says that it will encourage global companies to set up large manufacturing plants and it will enter into aircraft financing and leasing activities. Terming it as Green Budget, Prime Minister Narendra Modi described the Union Budget as citizen-friendly, development-friendly and future-oriented and one which will empower the poor and provide better future to the youth. ये देश को समृद्ध और जन जन को समर्थ बनाने वाला बजट है इस बजट से गरीब को बल मिलेगा युवा को बेहतर कल मिलेगा इस बजट के माध्यम से मध्यम वर्ग को प्रगति मिलेगी विकास की रफ्तार को गति मिलेगी इस बजट से टैक्स व्यवस्था का सरलीकरण होगा इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर का आधुनिकरण होगा India has lately been developing with one of the fastest rates in the world. It has not just become favorite investment destination but has now become a major investor as well. Enforced by the strong foreign policy, the world has liberalized its rule for India which has provided a better platform for India to grow and thrive. Moving on. 
The Pashtun Tahafuz movement, which has suffered a massive criticism and a sporadic crackdown from Pakistan establishment, is now voicing its protests at global platforms. The activists have upped their ante against the state atrocities. Recently, they demonstrated in front of the United Nations in Geneva to highlight the widespread human rights abuses being committed by the state agencies to muzzle their voices. Pashtun, one of the largest ethnic groups in the country, is the only group which doesn't seek secession from Pakistan. However, the demands do not carry any less anger and vigor. A report. A large number of Pashtuns gathered in front of the United Nations in the Swiss city of Geneva to highlight the widespread atrocities being committed against their community by the state of Pakistan. They chanted anti-establishment slogans and sought freedom from the rule of subjugation that has essentially kept them at bay from the mainstream. In a bid to gather international attention, a number of activists who have been fighting for the rights of Pashtuns from different countries exposed Pakistan during the event. They underlined how arbitrary detentions and forced disappearances and even killings by the state agencies were becoming a normal in Territon country and anyone daring to rise against the state was being framed. Lately, a number of Pashtun leaders have been arrested and sent to prison on one charge or the other. The activists have termed it a crackdown on dissent and demands. If demanding the production of missing persons or enforced disappeared people in the courts of law of Pakistan, is punished by torture by the state of Pakistan, then I have a bad news for the state of Pakistan that this torture will not stop us from demanding the production of the missing persons, missing Pashtuns to the court of law. The protesters have also urged the United Nations and the international community to investigate the widespread human rights violations, including targeted killings of Pashtun political activists in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Balochistan. Pashtuns who have been enduring Pakistani misrule for decades put up a resistance to suppressive forces last year after one of them was killed in a police raid. Since then, they have carried out two major protests. One was a two-week-long protest march from Khyber Pakhtunkhwa to Islamabad in the months of January and February, while other was held in April. While they do not seek secession and call themselves Pakistani nationals, they demand a life of equality and dignity. The key demands of Pashtuns include the clearance of landmines from tribal districts along the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. They want an end to the extrajudicial killings of innocent Pashtuns at the pretext of its war against terrorists. They want culprits to be held accountable and tried for the enforced disappearances that have occurred over the years. The movement has gathered steam in and out of Pakistan and its leaders believe that people are no more afraid of the all-powerful army. In Pashtun areas, there is a lot of resentment in Pashtun areas. The state of Pakistan has been raised in the state of Pakistan. The state of Pakistan has been raised in the state of Pakistan. And enough is enough. और इसमें खासकर पीटीएम ने जो अवेयरनेस क्रिएट की है सोशल मीडिया के थ्रू उसमें लोगों को दुनिया को पता चला है कि यानी ये जो ह्यूमन राइट्स वायलेशन हो रही है जो ह्यूमेनिटेरियन कैटास्ट्रोफी है पाटा में और खैबर पख्तूखा में उसका लेवल कितना बढ़ा है और पीटीएम ने बहुत बड़ा जो आम वो किया है और लोगों का जो खौफ था उनके जहनों में कि आप मिलिट्री के खिलाफ बोलेंगे तो आपको कत्ल कर देंगे आपको डिसपियर कर देंगे हकीकत भी है वो खौफ लोगों में खत्म हो गया 
Pashtuns comprise around 15% of the Pakistani population and are the second largest ethnic group in the country but regarded a minority. While the Punjabis enjoy all the perks and rights, Pashtuns are meted out a second-class citizen treatment. They have long blamed that they have been targets of military operations, internal displacement, ethnic stereotyping and abduction by the Pakistani security forces. They accuse that Pakistan army operates along with terrorists in the region and indiscriminately uses force against innocent Pashtuns. Moving on. It's been almost two years since hundreds of thousands of Rohingya refugees have taken a shelter in Bangladesh's border region of Cox's Bazar. The protracted discussions over their safe repatriation are yet to yield any results. While the exodus, which led to one of the biggest humanitarian crises, gathered global sympathy, the alleged perpetrators of the crime were never brought to justice. One international criminal court prosecutor, however, wants ICC to initiate an investigation into the issue. The Rohingya refugee in the Cox's Bazar of Bangladesh continue to live a life of pain and suffering as a much talk repatriation doesn't seem to be materializing anytime soon. They are here for almost two years and they have no idea of how many more months they will have to endure this precarious environment. Journalists, ambassadors, activists and the leaders have come and gone but the crisis prevails. There have been accusations and counter-accusations for the situation but no prosecutions. Since Myanmar is not a member of the International Criminal Court, even the top court has found itself paralyzed. However, with an amendment made last year by the ICC which gave it the jurisdiction over some crimes in the region when they had a cross-border nature, a prosecutor is demanding an investigation into the issue as Bangladesh is a member. Fato Bansora has asked the court's judges to authorize an investigation into alleged crimes against the Rohingya who were driven from Myanmar to Bangladesh. The request seeks authorization from the court's judges to open an investigation into alleged crimes within the jurisdiction of the court in which at least one element occurred on the territory of Bangladesh, a state party to the Rome Statute, and within the context of two recent waves of violence in Rakhine State on the territory of Myanmar, as well as any other crimes which are sufficiently linked to these events. If granted, the ICC would become the first international court to look into alleged atrocities against a Rohingya Muslim minority of Myanmar. She said there was a reasonable basis to believe that at least 700,000 Rohingya people were deported from Myanmar to Bangladesh through a range of coercive acts. I have determined that there is a reasonable basis to believe that at least 700,000 Rohingya people were deported from Myanmar to Bangladesh through a range of coercive acts and that great suffering or serious injury has been inflicted on the Rohingya through violating their rights to return to their state of origin. The Rohingya plights are only going to mount if the accountability is not held in immediate future as the Bangladesh government too has expressed its inability at accommodating any more refugees. Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina, had apprised UN last year that more than 1.1 million Rohingya had taken shelter in her country. UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, says 723,000 moved after August 2017. 
While the 55% of the total displaced Rohingya are under the age of 18, 52% of the displaced population is women and girls. An independent UN fact-finding mission in August concluded that Myanmar's military carried out mass killings and gang rapes of Muslim Rohingya. Bensaura's office began a pre-investigation examination in the Bangladesh-Myanmar case last year and a delegation from the court visited Bangladesh in March. Moving on. Rights activists from Jammu in Kashmir and other parts of the world exposed terror sponsor Pakistan and its sympathizers in the ongoing session of the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva. They also rubbished the first ever report released last year from the Office of UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. They termed it biased and contradictory to the stand of UN Security Council. A report. Prejudiced and misleading. The report on Kashmir released last year by the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights was pulled apart by the activists and experts present in the 41st session of the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva. Kashmiri said the 49-page report, which boasted of presenting the ground reality, was in fact a fact deficit document that didn't take into account the history or the people of the region under illegal occupation of Pakistan. In its first ever report on Jammu and Kashmir, the esteemed office has altogether ignored the fact that China occupies more than 20% of my homeland. The gifting of the Shaksam Valley in 1963 to Beijing by another occupier, Pakistan, violating UN Security Council Resolution 47 and the criminal abrogation of the state subject rule in Gilgit, Baltistan in 1974 have also not been mentioned in this report. The former High Commissioner has not been attentive to what happened in 1963 or 1974. The Indian government had earlier rejected the report, citing it a selective compilation of largely unverified information. Kashmiri accused China and Pakistan of hand in glove with each other in exploiting the region. They also sought an explanation on the omission of the China-Pakistan economic corridor which has largely been dubbed as the game changer, but in reality has rendered thousands homeless. China is constructing the China-Pakistan economic corridor through Gilgit-Baltistan, which historically and legally remains an inseparable part of the disputed territory of Jammu and Kashmir. Mr. President, the utter omission of the illegal construction of the CPAC, which is in contravention of international law, and the UN Security Council resolutions on Jammu and Kashmir, and the continuous exploitation of my land as collateral by Pakistan, while mortgaging the future of my people in order to defray its so-called all-weather friendship with China, have indebted the current High Commissioner to rectify the serious inaccuracies of this report. It is an established fact that Pakistan breeds, supports and exports terror from its soil. It has not only provided safe heavens to terrorists on illegally occupied Kashmiri soil, but has used terror as an instrument of state policy to spread mayhem across its two borders. Joanna Barakova, a research analyst from an Amsterdam-based organization, said that the commissioner had deliberately presented a false report despite the availability of invaluable insights. The report glosses over cross-border terrorism perpetrated by Pakistan security agencies while it labels UN-designated terrorist organizations such as Lashkar-e Taiba, Hezbollah Mujahideen and Jaish-e Mohammed as armed groups, negating UN parlance and contradicting the terminology of the UN Security Council's consolidated list of terrorist individuals and entities. Persistent violations of human rights has remained the story of Pakistan-occupied Kashmir in last seven decades. Extrajudicial killings, 
disappearances and discrimination against any opposition to Pakistan is a feature of everyday life. Pakistani military, which calls the shots regarding the policies of the region, is extensively engaged in the plundering of land and resources of the region. It has brutally crushed the voices of reason and dissent. The Kashmiris have been reaching out to international community for a long time. However, they have not seemed to gather enough traction at these platforms. Moving on, India is a cricket crazy nation. The lovers of the game push their limits of sanity and fervour for cricket. If you see a large crowd glued to TV sets at random places in India, then certainly a cricket match is underway. The fans have expressed their passion and enthusiasm for the game, not just by packing the stadiums during a match, but by various other things. Today, we'll show you two such instances where the love for the cricket is manifested in the form of cricket enthusiasts thronging a recently opened cricket museum and another fan preparing a World Cup miniature after India qualified for the knockouts in the ongoing World Cup. Have a look. As cricket fever grips South Asia, a cricket museum in India's western Pune city has witnessed a sudden surge in the number of visitors. The museum has rare cricket collectibles belonging to or signed by famous international personalities. The famous personalities who are part of the museum include former Indian cricket star Virendra Sehwag, former Australian captain Michael Clark, Sri Lankan legend Mahila Jaivardhane and Sanath Jaisuria, and West Indies star batsman Chris Gale. The museum not only connects the young enthusiasts to their idols but provides deep insights into the history of the Indian cricket. I am very excited to see cricket bats, jersey, and the 1975 World Cup was very good. The highest score is the highest score. I am very excited to see the While some have managed to come on their own, others have brought their parents and guardians along. My son is very crazy about cricket. He is very much obsessed. So, I came here with very low expectations. But after coming here, I knew that on this scale, all the articles and all the efforts have been made in this museum. The museum has been made in this museum. In another instance, a goldsmith in India's southern Bengaluru city have made a miniature World Cup trophy to wish the Indian team luck in the ongoing World Cup championship. The trophy weighing 0.49 milligrams and measuring 1.5 centimeters is attracting curious local residents from the area to his shop. The goldsmith Nagraj Revankar says, he has made the miniature World Cup trophy to make the cricket fans happy. The cricket season is going on, so we had a lot of interest in cricket fans. We had a lot of interest in cricket fans. We had a lot of interest in cricket fans. We had a lot of interest in cricket fans. We had a lot of interest in India. We had a lot of interest in India. So we had a lot of interest in this small World Cup. India have had a great run in the tournament so far and they are being deemed favourites along with England and Australia to clinch the trophy on 14th of July. India has won coveted trophy twice. First in the year 1983 under Kapil Dev and then in 2011 under the leadership of MS Dhoni. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.